Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Da Vinci Jeremy, a computer scientist and Bitcoin OG that discovered Bitcoin in its earliest days and was one of the first Bitcoin YouTubers. They discuss his journey into the crypto space in the very early days, what he says the real invention of Bitcoin is, his thoughts on Monero's money supply schedule versus Bitcoin's, how Bitcoin plans to secure its network once the block reward ends, as well as his take on privacy coins, specifically his positive stance on Monero. Monero Talk starts now. Been a pretty snowy winter though. How about you? Where are you at? I'm in Chile and we're nice and hot because it's our summertime here. So Beautiful, man. Beautiful. Love to go down there. What's what's the uh, crypto scene down there? Well, um, it's uh, they have a lot of places with a lot of uh, exchanges here in the local area. But uh, most people are not actually into crypto. But uh, slowly, stores are starting to accept it and so forth. There's like um, uh, what's it called? The payment processor here, right? Um, that uh, allows you to, to pay in Bitcoin, right, and so forth. So. Uh, it automatically converts uh, it to dollars for those people and for those businesses and so forth. So it's it's slowly coming, even though I've noticed that the, the, that the population itself is not um, uh, keen to it because they're they're like Americans. They just they're not 100 percent in, in need of it. Right. Um, because um, they have like, you know, uh, the, the top one percent or top 10 percent have. Uh, what's it called? The the UF, which is another currency. There's two currencies here. Uh, one is the Chilean pesos, and one is the UF, which is a, a index to inflation. So, um, uh, so people price things in UF to to avoid um, the inflation, right? So that's why it it uh, it's not really caught on as heavy as it is in most places in South America. Uh, right. I'm sure. Well, their their neighbors, right, in Argentina, are obviously a lot more aware of of, of the yeah. problems that money can have, right? Fiat money can have. Exactly. How long? How long have you been down there? Was that uh? Is it you've always been in Chile, or is that something that came about through your your crypto journey? Yeah, it did come about through my crypto journey. Um, also my journey through life, basically, because I always wanted to leave Canada, and uh, and I. Uh, I was just doing some research and I found that, you know, Chile was, um, you know, always a place where, you know, things would happen in the rest of the world and Chile would notice. They would uh, continue existing and running their lives like, oh, yeah, there's a world war going on. Oh, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> kind of kind of like that. Nothing, nothing, no major disruptions, right, in their uh in their lives here, here, right? So, um, whenever there was a major events in the worldwide events, right? Um, and so, uh, it seems like a safe, it seems like a safe place to be, right? Um, yeah, right. Uh, there is a social upheaving, which could destroy the, uh, the stability that, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, capitalistic, uh, government has had for quite some time, but, uh, hopefully they don't take hold and, uh, and uh, destroy the wealth that capitalism has provided them in the last 30 years um, when they switched from socialists to, to or communists to to, um, to uh, um, what's it called to capitalists. So, but it's always hard, right? Because um, you know the socialists uh, they they um, they teach the kids in the school. Oh my God, it's not fair. These people are like richer than you are. 
gotta take from them and it's it's a it's a growing problem right everywhere yeah um, capitalism provides the most wealth for the most amount of people while socialism provides the most amount of poverty for the most amount of people <laughs> I mean, couldn't agree with you more I, I ran for congress over here in new york and uh that that was you know a big part of my theme uh i ran on the republican line but uh very much a libertarian at heart as you can imagine uh mm -hmm. given my love of crypto like yours uh love your show man i wish i wish i had discovered it what is it 10 years ago i mean you started doing this when did you start talking about bitcoin and I guess you had a YouTube channel before you even started talking about Bitcoin. Yeah, I started talking about gold and silver right way back in 2011, 20, 2008, sorry, sorry, 2008. Um, and it was because I, I had learned how our monetary system transfers wealth from the poor and the middle class to the rich. And I realized how bad it was and how um, if it continued this way, um, you know, it would slowly just degrade society to a point where there's only the the oligarch cast and the poor, poor class and and then and usually that ends in the in a dark ages right right where where um, everybody's um, poor for a very very long time and, and and being under the control of some some dictator uh that's i mean stalin has written said you know the way sure way to um to destroy a society is to debauch, debauch the currency right it um, it uh, uses economic forces that only not one man in a million can uh, diagnose, uh, right? And uh, yeah, it it, it it takes away that power, their power to uh, control the, the the government because wealth is really the what controls the government, not voting. Yeah. So how did how did you learn? That was just something like a hobby you had on the side. You started learning about that on your own, or is your your profession in that? I think, or I guess you're a software engineer by. By profession, correct? Exactly. Actually, I was building when I figured out how what was going on with the monetary system. I was building a software for myself to uh, help me improve my programming skills. Um, and then um, I realized, oh my god, uh, I gotta research this how money works. And I started to deep diving into this. And then I and I stopped that hobby. Um, and I worked on uh, doing videos because I I I um. I didn't want to at first because I thought, well, I'm not like, you know, I'm not a public speaker. I'm not going to do well at this. And how many people are going to actually want to watch my stupid videos? And I, and I, quite a few I, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, you know what? Uh, there was a, st I remember the story when I was a child that, um, um, this, this, um, this little kid, I watched a video where this little kid, um, was uh throwing fish into water because they had all beached right a whole bunch of fish had beached on the uh, 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 uh the night before because of a storm and they were flapping around on the beach and he was throwing them one by one into the water and this little girl walks up to the little boy and says what are you doing and he says i'm trying to save the fish the fishes and the and the little girl looks around and he's like look around uh, there's, there's the whole beach is filled with fish. You're never going to save them all. So what's the point? And the boy said, well, it will, it, it, I can't save them all, but it will matter to the ones that I save. And so the little girl began to pick up the fish and start throwing them into the water. So I figured, okay, well, you know what? Even if I manage to save just one person, I think that will be enough. And who knows? Maybe somebody else would follow me. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I can. You, you, you probably got quite a few people involved in Bitcoin in the early days, right? I think it's fair to say that. When did you post that video of uh, buy a dollar worth of Bitcoin? I think that's one of your most viewed. Yeah, that video was uh, like um, what three years after I had uh, been in Bitcoin um, since 2011, because I got into. Uh, there was one video where I couldn't find it. I, I don't know what happened to it. It got thumbed down so much. I think YouTube took it off. I don't know what happened to it. It was um, it was a video when I first discovered Bitcoin and uh, I realized what it was. I, I once because one of my viewers said, "Hey, what do you think about Bitcoins?" I said, hey, "You know what?" I wrote him back quickly. I said, "Hey, this is a scam. I'm a software developer. There's no way somebody solved this uh, the double spend problem, which is how to prevent anybody from copying a digital asset." And 
and then uh, I said I was going to prove it to him, right, by reading through the source code and, and showing you how this person is trying to scam you. So I read through the source code, and then I realized that, oh, darn, he isn't. This is real. This is actually happening. And we're buying it. We're here at the bottom here, like the at the very at the at the very beginning of this this actual product here. And so I thought I, I did a video saying, hey, you know, every once in a while something comes along where you can buy it really really cheap and make you rich in the future. This is one of them. And so uh, and you can buy it for one dollar. So I, I I told I tried to explain to people what it was, how it worked. On that first video, and they all thumbed my my video. Thought I was crazy for 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 about several years. Actually, uh, there was lots of videos making fun of me, thinking that I was crazy, that I was stupid, that I had lost my mind. I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I did my best to try to explain it, but it was not going getting through to people i mean i think I, a total of five people actually bought on my recommendation back then and of those five like two of them like uh donated like 100 bitcoins to them right 100 bitcoins to me so oh yeah, wow was, yeah exactly That's amazing thank you me for the for that uh that call there so uh, oh, awesome that's so cool. And uh, for everybody else, I mean, let, lesson learned, right? Be a little bit more open-minded, which is what, you know, what I try to maintain on this show. I'm always trying to, for me, my pursuit is I'm trying to figure out which one is the best form of digital gold cash. Obviously, Bitcoin is doing quite well with that. Uh, I, I think Monero has particular properties that uh, make it compete very well in that sector. We'll get into that for a second. So before you even got into to Bitcoin, were you looking at some of these other attempts like uh, the Digi Golds, like the, the things that came before Bitcoin? Were you even were you were you that guy too, looking at at those type of things? I, I think I've looked at one uh, of them, right? Uh, Flues or something like that. I can't remember what it was called. Flues or something. Anyways. And I realized that, that, that yeah, those, that one failed. And I did try to build a Bitcoin, uh, some something like Bitcoin, before it ex before I knew it existed. Really? And that's when I learned. That's when I learned that uh, you know there, it was not possible to build a system like this that was like decentralized, um, because other people, computer scientists, have been trying to build it for so long that uh, you know it's one of those uh, computer science problems that just can't be solved. And uh, yeah, so that's when when I when I realized it was solved, it was like, oh my god, right? You know, we have something that that was thought to be impossible now being possible. So it's very it's critical. It's a huge thing. What do you see as being the real invention of Bitcoin? What is the value proposition, or even looking at it as from the standpoint of a software engineer, what is the invention? If you had if you had to patent it, what's that? that inventive step that makes it so uh, so novel and such a breakthrough? I don't think there's one particular piece to it because um, you can always point to some some uh, one particular piece and then some people say, hey, you know what? Well, you can do that sort of like in the banking system, right? So you have to you have to put it all into to one context, right? Uh, all together. So, for example, one is the limited supply which makes it a ruler that does not change so imagine trying to um build a house where the ruler where you had to you are you were an architect and the numbers on the ruler kept changing right so the the uh, an inch would be like this and then like the big, bit bigger and then a bit smaller and then a bit bigger every time you did a measurement well you'd never be able to build a nice uh, solid house now would you well, now we have um, we have a system where um, it's easier for people to actually understand because you need to be a genius in order to figure out our current monetary system and be well wealthy. But with this, with uh, Bitcoin, you know the measurement, you know the measuring sticks will always be this size and not change, and in fact shrink a little bit, which will be actually benefit to, beneficial for you, so that you could always measure. Okay, well, you know what. Um, if I have this much, if I have uh, like a 0 .0, 0 0.01 Bitcoin, I know into this this particular time in the future that I'll have enough to survive to do this or to do that. You'll be able to plan for a long term event. Another uh, uh, advantage is that um, 
if there's ever um, a, a ever someone, uh, some dictator or some government coup, crazy coup that happens here anywhere in the world, wherever you are, you can put all your wealth into Bitcoin and just walk across the border going, darn, I got, I don't got anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you got money. You got billions of dollars in your head, right? Um, and so uh, that's another critical thing about uh, Bitcoin because try to do that in our current monetary system. You could possibly leave it, transfer it away to another country. But again, if, if there was a coup, too late. They're going to close down any kind of wealth transfer from from their borders, right? To try to keep you inside, right? And trap you. So now that's not a problem, right? You can easily go to an asset that is works worldwide. And another final thing that uh, makes it bonus, what makes it incredible is that you could send this wealth asset, right? To anyone in the world in a very short amount of time compared to our current system, which always annoyed me. I, um, I always wondered why are we taking why am I taking five to seven days and actually and having the banking system lose the money in some cases to wire it to somebody and they would lose it sometimes and it would take about a month for them to find it. Why is it this way? It doesn't make any sense to me. It never made sense to me. But now now that I understand why that the, the, the it's a messaging system that has multiple layers and multiple actually they actually manually in order to do a wire transfer, they do a lot of manual paperwork. And so obviously miss things are going to go um, go awry in that uh, process uh, in some cases. So yeah, um, w that's a huge, this is a huge advantage, right? So all three of these these things, right, um, make it a, a, mon a monetary system that's a thousand times better, right, than the one that we currently have. And it just takes time. It's just like, for example, when you, when we invented electricity, you can expect like people expected that, oh my gosh, well, you know what? This is useless because uh, we don't have, how are you going to get the power to, you don't know how to get the power to the people. They don't have, when you do get the power there, they don't have it on their houses. So what's use good is it? And also, uh, if you want to change for the, because it was back then when they first developed electricity, it was DC electricity. When you want to get it to some place, you're going to need a cable the size of a bus just to get it from the power plant to the city. How's that going to be useful? And yet, you know, over time, right, uh, people figure things out. Like, for example, Tesla figured out, hey, you can change it. We don't have to send DC electricity. We can go to AC and just uh, and then convert it to DC when it gets to the person's house. And then we just need a small cable to get it to that, that, at that person, to that place, right? I, mean, I, want, I want to break. Oh, I'll let you continue yeah. if you have more thoughts. I just wanted to break down some of the things he said, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah so, um, yeah. So the, the key, th the key thing is right. That uh, we don't, you don't have to just wait for the invention to mature and people to start. You can't expect it to just overnight transform society. And that's what everybody wants something overnight. And that's just not happening. Right. You have to you have to look up uh, into the future that, hey, this is going to get built out. This is going to be used. You have to see beyond just what's right in front of you. And that's really difficult for most people, I've noticed. So the first thing to limited supply, is it really uh, limited supply that you see as being it or just um, kind of a, a known supply or a known schedule, a money, you, you know, money supply schedules, the fact that it's uh, strictly limited or the fact that it's, um, you know, known and, and that supply schedule can never be changed because I ask you because, uh, you know, in, in Monero, the, the supply is also known. The schedule is, is known and forever known. And the idea is it will never change. Uh, but it's not strictly limited in that, you know, there will be a tail emission. I don't know how familiar you are with Monero. Um, with Monero, you continue to mine, but the idea is that's because it's ensuring the security of the network throughout time. So I feel like one of one of the advantages uh, of Monero and its architecture is that its supply schedule may even be more reliable than Bitcoin's because in Bitcoin, there's a little bit of an unknown there as to whether or not 
a strict supply of 21 million is going to work or if we're going to need uh, additional mining to happen in the future that's going to supplement it beyond the transactional fees. Uh, and that's, you know, because that's kind of theoretical at this point, whether or not transactional fees are going to be enough to secure the network when you when you lose the essentially block reward. So I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. OK, um, yeah, I, uh, I I think that it, here's the thing, right, um, because we were t dealing with a digital asset. Right. There is no end to its divisibility. So effectively, there could be just one Bitcoin. It doesn't matter. Right. Um, we can always just split that up into a smaller, uh, smaller amount, smaller, ever small, increasingly smaller amounts. It really doesn't matter because we're using it as a monetary unit. Now, uh, the what the advantages of um, having a strict supply over uh, increasing supply is that um, one, uh, you could say that, yes, it's possible for you to, to project, project out what's happening because it's, it's you understand what the supply constraints are so you can do modeling. But not everybody has that that ability to understand that those models. Um, most people live in a basic sort of form of life where they understand a, a very basic rules and principles. They don't they can't uh, they can't comprehend Oh, well, you know what? This creation of this money means that you're going to have an increasing supply so that you need to plan for that increasing supply. Most people can't plan for that. So having a fixed supply makes it easier for people to um, to understand how to plan. Right. Also, uh, another issue, right, which I think is a critical issue now uh, that after after months of studying it, basically, um, after looking at uh, what's it called um, the uh, the Wimble Mimble uh, coin, um, uh, what's it grin called? or grin? Yes, grin. I realized that that was a big mistake for them to actually have a forever increasing supply. Why is that? Well, because um, how do you detect an inflation bug where when you having a, a a currency that prevents you from knowing exactly how much is actually out there and who has what if you have a fixed number eventually you'll be able to determine hey wait a second here there's um there's a, a problem right if you fail to have like a terminating terminating number it's going to be very difficult to see that you have a problem Right. Well, you'll know. I mean, for at least Monero, you'll know what that number should be at any moment in time. Yeah, it's just that um, you know somebody could actually just if somebody somebody if I were to find an inflation bug in in any particular uh, um, high uh, what's it called encrypted um, um, uh, currency where they prevent you from seeing who has what and what or how much. Um, if I found it right um, and I wanted to exploit it. The best way for me to exploit it is to not tell anyone and use it and only uh, extract a small amount of wealth from it every single time, less than something that would go noticed, right? And so that makes it e harder for developer team to actually find the bug, right? And close it out, right? Because there's been inflation bugs in Bitcoin, right? Uh, several, in fact, right? Um, and that were closed out. And so how do you know that that doesn't exist in Monero? Only time will tell at this point. Um, it makes it harder for 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 uh, for uh, basically to do analysis on the whole network to determine, is there an inflation bug happening here? Is somebody getting away with a lot of money here that we don't know about, right? Uh, and we've missed a bug here. It makes it difficult without a fixed number. So... Yeah, I, oh God, I'll let you finish your thought. So yeah, that's my that's my issue with um, with that. Also, and, and so those are the two issues. One is it's uh, people uh, some and it requires somebody with a higher intelligence to to uh, to uh, basically understand the, um, the 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 mathematical model of uh, increasing supply, um, and then also um, you know inflation bugs right can happen any time, especially since. Uh, this is a, a product that's that's in the works and, and that's increased that's being fixed uh augmented and you, you never know what could actually trigger that bug they they could just you know add something to the database uh, add change um uh, change uh, what's it called um uh, how they store a file to the database not realizing that hey that has nothing to do with uh 
uh, the protocol, but then somehow it does, and boom, right? Somebody finds a way to uh, exploit it, right? So these are the things you have to be very, very careful with. When yeah, I mean, the, the analogy I like, or the way I like to think of it, is um, you know, like any like any great technology, you know. So so the car, obviously, the the Model Four T is a lot more easier to to verify whether or not it's working versus you know uh the tesla which is basically a black box that you can't even look inside uh yet you know we, we all rather drive around in driverless um, uh teslas right where we're essentially trusting all the engineering that's behind it right and it's been verified by very intelligent people that that are looking at it and over time we gain trust and eventually we're all going to be driving around in in Teslas without even holding the steering wheel. So I think you know with Bitcoin uh, and versus Monero same thing and, and it comes at a, a great benefit because what are you gaining? You're gaining fungibility and privacy. So it's uh with with that that sacrifice of of ease of audibility you're you're getting a lot. Um but I guess I would love to hear your response to that and back to the original question though are you concerned about the uh the security uh, of bitcoin given the fact that there's that 21 million limit because a lot of bitcoin's core um values is around this idea that security comes first yet there does seem to be a little bit of a question mark there as to how the network will be secured in the future when when mining has when the block reward has completed and we're now just relying on transaction fees that that's yeah. that's kind of my my gripe there with the 21 million caps so i'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that i don't see that being an issue i think um you know the, the transaction fees will be enough because uh you know the the miners will will charge what they what will act, actually request that people uh, in order to get into the block, right, you have to do a certain set of uh, specific height, uh, a specific amount of uh, of transaction um, fees in order to, to for them to even bother mining your transaction. Of course, now there will be miners that will do it for free, um, but okay. uh, the overall miners will probably request that uh, hey, you know what, you have to have certain uh, threshold before they uh, they do. And with a competing market, right, I mean it's not a problem. Um, and you know, Bitcoin because it's a fixed supply, that means that the, the value of that coin will always be increasing uh, because we have our population increasing. We have the uh, we have also the uh, what's it called the, the amount of coins that might disappear increasing. But really, you should ignore that because um, as technology improves, right? Um, although um, it's possible that the encryption get uh, gets broken and it's designed to for that uh, bitcoin is designed to, to make the encryption if the encryption gets broken you can upgrade it um and same with the hashing but um so you have to assume that that's going to happen and that means that the of those 21 million that are some of those are lost they're eventually going to be found sometime in the future right um so uh you have to count them into your uh into your uh, any kind of thesis right that hey those bitcoins those lost coins sometime into the future are going to be found again so that's another thing you have to remember um once it, because it's a fixed supply it means you, you could easily always count them in even though um they haven't moved for you know decades or centuries or whatever it might be uh, and it won't be a problem because you know what um uh, right now yeah it might be a problem if uh, all of a sudden you know there's 20 million that were lost right and then some technology finds them all again <laughs> but um still right the the results is at the end right it will it will all level out right if everybody were acted as if it was um 21 million which would probably not be the case in that in that scenario right if we lost 20 million bitcoins and, <laughs> and there was only a million circulating left it, the people would act as if there was only a million uh, until that day that it was all 20 million was unlocked. But again, um, the thing is, uh, encryption, when you break, when, I, when encryption is broken, it's not like, oh, tomorrow I can figure out what your private key is. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, we've broken it. it. All of our encryptions that we've broken in the past, we ended up going, oh, look at that. In three months, I could actually find what the private key is. I mean, so um that's what we're probably going to have a point where hey you know what oh if i 
if my with this computing power within 10 years i'll be able to figure out what your private key is and that would be considered broken even though it would take the computer 10 years to figure out what one private key is right uh it'd still be considered broken and um and as computer cycles uh, increase right which is every 18 months um that would be cut in half every 18 months um that time frame but within that the, in that same time frame right um developers would uh, change the encryption protocol and uh, it wouldn't be a problem anymore and of course any coins that were that were lost and they can actually get a hold of they will just you know be able to get a hold of those coins but that's about it they won't be able to get anything else yeah so another Another main feature you talked about is basically uh, the censorship resistance or this unconfiscatable nature. So, you know, I could abscond with my with my crypto across the border or I can send it to anybody and essentially can't be stopped. Um, don't you think Bitcoin's transparent ledger takes away from some of that ability to do that? So once again, that sacrifice has been made. Um, you know, given the design of Bitcoin, but that's, I see that as being one of the costs, right? So I, I can, in, in more of a censorship resistant way, send you Monero or, you know, cross the border with my Monero without worry that, you know, some, you know, some authority would be able to see how much I have or, you know, whether or not I eventually spend it. Uh, you know, there's, there's the meme, you know, my, uh, I, lo I lost my keys in a boating accident. Uh, I often see, you know, uh, I lost my private keys in a voting accident. I often see Bitcoiners now saying that on Clubhouse, and I just don't see how that applies in Bitcoin. So I, I think there's a uh, a failing there, and I'd love to hear your opinion on that and whether or not you think potentially something like Monero uh, does that better and is yes, and whether that's vital. That, that's 100%, and it is vital. Um, because um, it, it, but governments can destroy the fungibility of Bitcoin because they can track where that Bitcoin is and say that that Bitcoin is bad. And then uh, count if they make that, um, that they, if they say that Bitcoin is bad and it can be tracked to wherever it goes and then uh, me merge with other Bitcoins and then take the whole pool. That's that's a negative on, on Bitcoin. Right. Of course. Right. Um, so that's where the space where where um, you know uh, privacy coins are very important and very necessary uh, because uh, if Bitcoin does not have privacy first, uh, people are going to need a, a privacy coin only, and it's unfortunate because um, um, if you want to have privacy in the sense that hey you know what I don't want any cameras to take a look at my face, you you should have a right to do so right. But try entering a bank with a ski mask on and see what happens. <laughs> it's not, you don't get treated. Well, in, in, this, in this day and age, you'd be fine, right? <laughs> you just get treated. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be a good citizen that's practicing, uh, you know, like the COVID, uh, COVID rules. Exactly. I mean, it's uh, exactly. That's true. That's true. And this, uh, yeah, you know, that's amazing. You know what? I just realized <laughs> you're right. Everybody is walking into a bank with a mask on. <laughs> That's the time. But, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, but the point is, right, um, right now, it makes it look like you're trying to hide something if you go to Monero and you, you're not. You have the right to um, have privacy within your own financial transactions and not have anybody see what you're doing. Um, uh, it doesn't mean you're a criminal because you don't want somebody else to see what you're doing or any government to see what you're doing is you just don't trust the government and you have good rights to not trust the government because we've seen time and time again how they abuse their power they use their the information that they've gathered on you and although you didn't do anything legal at the time now that we have this new regime on here oh you read that book well i think you need to go to jail and be really educated that's the problem that you want. That's what your privacy is. You're trying to protect your private. You're, you're trying to protect your financial transactions from that event, basically. And it's not being super paranoid as some people might consider it. It's happened before. It's happened. It's happened over and over again in her history. And there's nothing wrong with somebody protecting themselves. Uh, they're going to look like a genius if they did. 
and then you're going to look like, oh, man, I wish I'd done that. It should some, something like that, which always happens in our history, occur. <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's like, it, it, you know what? It's, it's funny how people go, well, that's never going to happen. But it's happened before. Well, it's not going to happen now. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, it makes me, it, 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 it irks me because, you know what? It's like saying, you know what? Um, people have died before, but now nobody's going to die. I mean, come on. <laughs> we go through these cycles over and over again. It might not happen in your lifetime, but it happens over a certain period of type of life cycles, right? Hundreds of years or something like that. So you want to be able to make sure that it doesn't happen in your life cycle and protect yourself. That's all you're doing. Sorry, your volume, your volume. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I muted for a second. I got trucks past them. I'm in, a, I'm in a new area today. Do you think governments may try to confiscate Bitcoin at some point in the future? Or, you know, there, there are some governments around the world, not necessarily America, but in some places. Do you think that will ever come to pass? Oh, definitely. They will definitely try to confiscate your Bitcoin uh, one way or another. And uh, they'll try to do it through, uh, you know, going door to door and knocking on your door and say, hey, listen, we have, um, you know, we've seen your, your IP address, uh, Bitcoin protocol come out from there. We've seen your from your phone. Uh, you need to give us what uh, we figure we've done to the chain analysis and you need to give us what uh, we see on your uh, from from our analysis. Right. Um it is possible because uh, a state level actor can see exactly what is going on um, and from where. Um, uh, they just don't know if it's you or not, for sure. Uh, because of, um, because uh, uh, like for example, if you only did your transactions from your house, you have some plausibility, deniable, possible deniability should you have more one person living in your house. You could say, well, it's not me, it could be somebody else in the house, right? But again, it's usually, you know, a family of four or something like that. So what, are you going to blame your children? Are you going to blame your, your spouse? <laughs> so, well, even even, even that, they, they could just simply look to see, for the most part, where you got them off of some KYC AML exchange, yeah, right? That that too, that too, right? Um, so yeah, uh, you could always, and then, but the thing is, right, you could always move it to different locations. Um, and they don't know if those locations are yours unless they do some chain analysis again with against um, against IP analysis as well. Then they can determine that hey, you just moved them from one address to another um, uh, to hide that. And so that's the, that's what a, the, another way they can um, check. Now, of course, if you run a node, um, there is po it is possible to be completely anonymous on Bitcoin, but it's a lot. You have to run your node in the tour. You got to like make sure that you have a, a properly connected tour to a non-governmental agency because governments try to um, um, create uh, gateway tour gateways to so so they can, so they can detect that you are doing certain uh, things through that tour. Um, uh, so you'd have to do a lot, a lot of a lot of work in order to make sure that no state level actor. Uh, can understand where you're getting your bit, when you're sending bitcoins, when you're receiving bitcoins, if you're receiving bitcoins. But it is possible. It's just not. It's not practical for the average person. And it's becoming, I think, more difficult in many ways. So, so do you do you encourage people to then you know look at you know Monero and coins like Monero for those purposes, for those use cases? Oh, definitely. I have some Monero myself, and I have quite a bit of Monero. Uh, not as much as any other coin, any of my top coins, but I do have a quite a, a quite a sizable amount, and because I see that it has a, a strength to it that uh, will, will will not die so far, and um, and I like pri uh, uh, privacy coins, so I'm interested in uh, getting pr more and more privacy coins. If should Bitcoin decide not to add privacy to it, however, it is planned right with uh, a lot of with Schnorr signatures and uh, taproot 
that uh, we can have um, privacy transactions once those things are implemented or if those things are implemented because we, we it's really difficult to get uh, new features into Bitcoin. But hey, if those things are implemented, right, we're, we're stepping in the right direction and, and get more options for privacy in, in Bitcoin. So I'm looking forward to that that as well. Should 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 those things fail, right? Because again, they're not 100% foolproof, right? Because Bitcoin was not privacy first. So it's difficult to add privacy into Bitcoin after the fact. Um, so if there's, it's best to have a, a basket of uh, privacy coins and, and Monero should be one of them, if you ask me. Awesome. We'll, we'll definitely quote you on that. Um, so y- you started as a gold bug, which was, uh, which was great. And because that combined with your, your software engineering sk- skills, it was kind of, it was the perfect storm at the perfect time. Um, what I guess, uh, in your early videos, I, w- I was watching some of them, and I saw I saw you would kind of always say yes, but B- Bitcoin isn't money. You would always you would always say that. Is that uh, do you still categorize it as that? You would, or uh, what? What were you say? What What did you mean then, and how do you look at it now versus then? Okay, so when I said it wasn't money, it meant that um, it may have missed one key point, which was a unit of account. Still, is not exactly money today. Right. You can you can say call it your money and that's fine. It just is not you can't I can't, for example, in my business say, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to pay my suppliers in Bitcoin, have fixed contracts in Bitcoin and uh, have my whole um, uh, accounting in Bitcoin. No. Right. It's not a unit of account. That's not possible. Right. Um, So uh, you can't count it yet as money. Right. However, you can in a in your own personal sense, right? Which is what I do, right? Uh, say, hey, you know what? This is money for me, and uh, I'd rather have this, in a sense, not not in my business sense, but in my personal sense. That hey, this is my money. I'm gonna save it, and I I know that you know what the value is going to fluctuate in one one way really high, and then another way really low. But I'm willing to accept those fluctuations because overall, over time, they will get evened out and get smaller and to a point where um, it could actually be a unit of account. And once it does, then uh, I, I I will be a lot wealthier in, in the future when it is a unit of account. So I'm looking forward to that day um, because, um, hey, you know what? That's coming. And, and, and when it does come... If you have one whole Bitcoin, even just one whole Bitcoin, you are going to be in the top 1%, right? It's going to be absolutely incredible. So do you still believe in gold? Are you still uh, a holder of gold? Do you still see gold as money? Or do you think uh, cryptos have made them obsolete, essentially, for those use cases? Uh, they've, they've done the same. They've made, uh, they've made uh, gold... They've made the dollar obsolete as well as gold crypto, basically, because um, uh, it's just going to take some time, right? Of course, for gold, a little bit more time for gold because um, it has 5,000 years of history. It's going to take a lot uh, of uh, a lot more time and a lot more generations, right? Probably another 100 years before you see it, gold disappear as a, as a monetary store of value um, um, because, of, because of Bitcoin. Uh, it has that because it has that historical precedent. Uh, it has that uh, value proposition that 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 works through time, and and it's never gonna uh, the it's not never. It's just it's gonna take time for that to go away. Um, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's still gonna be it's still gonna be valuable. It's still gonna uh, have a monetary unit val- unit value. Um, you know that central banks have not decided. You haven't heard one single central bank say. Uh, yeah, we're going to divest from gold and uh, go get some Bitcoin on our balance sheet yet. <laughs> Keyword yet. <laughs> but uh, once that happens, yeah, you, you, the gold price is uh, gold is going to have some a serious world of hurt. Uh, once the central bankers go, oh, okay, we we're leaving the gold standard now. Did, did you ever talk to Peter Schiff about it? So you being, you know, coming from being a, a big gold guy to a crypto guy, well, you know, Peter Schiff has never been able to make the 
the jump and connection you've made between crypto and gold. Curious if you ever spoke to him about it and wh why he, you know, why you think maybe he, he just can't move on. Uh, I haven't spoken to him about it, but I understand where he under why he feels this way completely. And it makes sense because he re I read the same books that he did. Right. And one of the one of them, they talked about how money has to come from um, has to come from the uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, some commodity, basically, it has to come as a useful tool first. Right. And then convert over to money. That was the thesis. And uh, I think it was uh, it wasn't human action. It was like Mises. Um, I can't remember the name of the book. But anyways, um, it, it came from that. I, I, th I think he read that. And I remember reading that same paragraph going, that's not true. Uh, because I never I stopped after after I realized how our financial how our financial system works. I realized I cannot just blindly accept what somebody writes, what somebody writes and says this is a law. I don't blindly accept Moore's law. Um, I think that it was it's a it, it's a good um, measurement tool until it stops working, right? Moore's law, right? That's all it is for me. Uh, it doesn't it, it doesn't have any basis in mathematical mathematics basically it has just a model that it's a model that if something changes drastically in human inventions gets thrown out the window right <laughs> so, so um and so uh when i read that so basically um going back to my point right um is that you, he's he's stuck in the, the 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 same thing that happens to everybody who goes to school and studies um, uh, Keynesian economics. Well, the book said that this is true, so it's got to be true. They they pair it back. Hey, you know what? Um, whenever there's an economic downturn, governments need to start spending, right? They don't question that statement, right? And that's what he came into. That's what he's stuck in. He didn't question the statement of what he said, what he was reading, because everything else made sense, right? Yes, everything else you were reading made sense. But so he connected that basically everything else that he read made sense. That means what he was saying about how money came into existence had to be true. And so it's an absolute, but that's not true because it was based on his speculation of how money should come into existence. No. Money is not is not something that we. Uh, oh yeah, I'm going to use this as a trade, uh, like like for example, cigarettes or whatever. I'm going to use this as a trade commodity first. I'm going to use it as smoking first, and then like let's say it's a cigarette, right? I'm just going to smoke it. Oh, by the way, I could trade it for something, and because there's no actual money, and so that means it, it because it was used for something else, it means it could be money. No, no. Money, what people don't understand about money is that it, it exists as a, as an aggregate in our in of all things that we trade. And you're like, aggregate of all things that we trade? What do you mean? <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> it means that money is not some magical thing that most people are separate from anything from separate from this 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 little doohickey that I got in my hand this mouse this this uh, case this microphone uh, the computer your car whatever you think whatever you think that you want it exists just as another thing and because it's another thing someone can invent a better thing called money <laughs> that's all it is is just another thing. The fact that what makes it confusing and makes it so magical is that 50, uh, it's 50% of all transactions uh, that occurs in humanity. So that means it is the most valuable asset of all, the, of everything that humanity has. Yeah, it all makes sense to me. And, and the most perfect form of it is the thing that really can only be used as money it almost makes more sense that it would have no other use cases, right? Making it purely usable only as money. 
Um, and you know, I feel like if if you just look at the the aspects of what what made gold become gold, it's you know it's very clear, like the fact that it is you know scarce and durable and fungible, which you know I I, I think is essential. One of one of the things that you had mentioned in your early or videos and talking about Bitcoin was a potential fear of it. I heard you say it in passing of it being co-opted. You know, this is in the early days, right? Because you're concerned of, you know, can this thing maintain its uh, ability to be, you know, essentially separate from, from the powers that be that already have a, a grapple over everything. Um, do you still have that fear? Do you think the fact that, you know, Monero, uh, I'm sorry, Bitcoin in many ways is the perfect surveillance tool. It seems like governments are actually okay with the fact that everybody's using Bitcoin because maybe it's going to lead to a scenario where they can uh, more effectively track and trace and control. Is that a, is that a fear or thought that you, you think about with regards to, to Bitcoin? Not really. I, I, I think that uh, governments uh, um, can't really stop. They understand that. I think the one thing they understand, they can't stop this because it's just math and the means of communications. And because of the laws that, that are already on the book, it'd be really difficult, especially in the United States, for them to, to ban uh, a means of communications, right? Uh, a judge would throw them out uh, really fast, right? Uh, because it, uh, it's, it, 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 it's on free speech, right? Basically, hey, you know what? Can I speak uh, this transmission of um, basically zeros and ones to somebody, which is basically sending them Bitcoin, right? Uh, you have free speech in the United States. And uh, and when they tried to um, stop encryption, somebody pointed it, put it in, into a song and that's it. It's for, protected by free speech, right? So um, uh, that's what your, your, your and so your, uh, your trans transmission of, um, of a um uh, of a, a transaction right which is just zeros and ones just zeros and ones uh of numbers a set of numbers you can't stop you can't the government can't stop you from from, from speaking those zeros and num those those numbers basically so that i'm not worried about that and they and that's why they they i don't see them um um you know trying to they're not trying to stop it because uh, they're not trying to stop it because they go oh we could try to take it over no 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 um, first off, governments are not that smart. <laughs> they never were. Um, they are always controlled by outside forces, um, which is corporate, major corporations, right? Um, so uh, effectively, what uh, other major corporations, such as banks, are probably thinking is that uh, the, the, they always try to, to coerce, corrupt, and get in from behind, right? Okay. Um, and they do, it is possible. And even if they don't come up with a way to do it right now, they might not have anything in the pipelines right now. There is a future where, where, uh, um, for example, they convince people to, to go off of, uh, uh, a fork off of Bitcoin to their own, uh, Bitcoin. Right. So for example, let's just, how would that be possible? Well, currently, um, I, I can give you an example. Um, is it possible for you to install your own operating system on an iPhone? I don't, I don't have my iPhone here, but um, you know, is it possible to install your own operating system on an iPhone? No, right? Now, Very imagine difficult. If we, yeah, exactly. Now imagine, imagine if you have a, a, a device that um, um, uh, that is um, that is only for Bitcoin, right? Uh, that you've purchased to a corporation, right? Which is, this, this is what's gonna happen in the future. And is it possible that they are going to say, no, no, you can't install your own Bitcoin software on that device. That's very possible. And then once that's the people accept that, right? Um, then it becomes impossible to say, okay, well, now that, now that, now it's becomes possible for a government or really at the banks or some sort of some sort of evil entity to convince the government to say, hey, you know what? There's not enough money here. So and if and then since everybody else is using this device, we're going to install a new uh, uh, system, new Bitcoin uh, that uh, has uh, increases the supply because, you know what? We can't borrow more. We can't. More, the, the people who have borrowed all this Bitcoin, they can't pay it back. We need more Bitcoin in order for them to pay it back. 
right? So that's what's going to have probably we're going to see happen in the future. That will be the big test of Bitcoin. Can it be resilient enough to go? Uh, can people be realized? No, 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 no. Uh, I'm just going to use this old device, old way of doing things, right? And uh, continue with the current, the, the, um, the, the, my fork, right? And not your fork. That's going to be difficult because for a lot of time, going forward in the future, we're going to have devices that we cannot control because we already have it right now. That's, you see that as being one of the potential threats. Yes. Are, are there any other great threats you see to, to Bitcoin? Um, right now, all the, all the, the only threat is obviously um, the, the, uh, somehow so that uh, the, the hash would probably be the hash would be the biggest problem, biggest threat, which is very difficult to, to see how that, that's possible. But if the hashing algorithm is broken, um, um, that and is broken in, in a way that it's fast to actually create a hash, that would be a big problem, right? Because we're using it for one, hiding our public key, two, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, building the, the, um, the, the uh, what's it called? The blockchain. So if we could build the, rebuild the blockchain instantly, that would destroy the fact that, hey, we have the history that cannot be changed. How about uh, a fear of of mining centralization? Bitcoin is primarily mined by ASICs. ASICs are primarily produced uh, by one or two companies. Most of the mining uh, has been taking place in China, which is a regime that has pretty much control over all of its people and could, you know, potentially at will take over, uh, you know, the Bitcoin mining farms there. Do you have any? Uh, concern there that Bitcoin is not built in a way that will maintain its decentralized nature in terms of mining. No, uh, um, if they tried that, they would. Uh, the developers could easily kick them out, and the, the, um, the community would vote against any kind of uh, if they tried to do that. But besides, even if they did, what what what? what let's just take a look at what they would gain um, by taking over the mining let's pretend that they did they had what did they gain can they go back and change this history no right they can't right can they um tell you oh no you know what we can um have more than 21 million no they can't right so what can they do well they could basically okay. censor let me, let me, let me, okay let me go ahead you. let me tell you they can't censor because they only have 51 percent right <laughs> or less, and it will, it will diminish really fast, right? Because people will go freaked out. But let's just pretend that they had 51%, right? Or more, 60%. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, censor transactions, right? Because uh, the other miners would, um, would, would build other uh, transactions that uh, would not be, would show up, and they would always be behind. So they'd have to like always decide to go on a higher chain and, and trans certain transactions will have to go through as uh, in, 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 anyway. So there's no way for they can censor transactions unless they had 100% power, right? <laughs> That's the only way. Now, since 100% is not possible, um, there's no way for trans to censor transactions. The only thing they can do, the only thing they can do is double spend. So they can go to transfer the Bitcoin to somebody and then uh, wait two blocks and then try to double spend that back away from them. But then, wait a second, all that the, um, the um, what's it called, the exchange houses have to do or anybody has to do is increase their, the number of blocks that they're, they're willing to accept as a, a confirmed transactions. And that, that, that extra uh, power becomes useless, absolutely useless. And meanwhile, everybody's going to be working forward towards stopping them. It's a waste of time. Are you familiar with uh, Monero's um, random X proof of work that has essentially allowed Min Monero to maintain its ASIC resistance? Um, no, I haven't heard of the random X um, protocol. Um, uh, it's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, maybe I should take some time to, to, to read about it. Yeah, definitely um, take a look. 
Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's, if it has remained ASIC resistant, uh, I'm wondering: is that the patented technology, or is it um, uh, is it still open? Is it open source so that anyone can use? Oh, it? Oh no, everything's obviously completely open source. And traditionally, you know, so Monero has always tried to maintain its ASIC resistance, and uh, historically, it's done it by essentially changing its proof of work every you know year or so, six months. Uh, but then it, it eventually invented a, a proof of work that seems to be uh, working very well as an ASIC resistant proof of work, essentially making the CPU the ASIC of Monero. So the most efficient way to mine Monero is through, uh, you know, a CPU. I so. See. so what you're saying is uh, they don't do any hard forks anymore. They used to do hard forks. Uh, to in order to bake it ASIC resistant, but not anymore because they have a new technology. Yes, that doesn't require hard forks in order to make it ASIC resistant. Interesting. So, I always thought that that was always a hard fork thing. So, um, uh, I'm very interested now. Yeah, Howard Chu is an extremely in, uh, intelligent guy, and he uh, he created this uh, along with others too. Um, I I think that. Uh, that was amazing. That was great. And I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know uh, we had a little technical difficulties in the beginning, which I apologize, but uh, I like using this Jitsi thing. We have a lot of privacy oriented guests that prefer Jitsi. You know, there's no no login. You just you just click the link. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, you've been an amazing contribution to the crypto community. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go back and continue to watch some of your older videos. I just, I, you have so many of them. It's insane, but it's just, it's just really cool to watch and go back in that, in those early days and see how you were talking about these things as they were literally uh, coming to be. So uh, thank you, man, so much for your work. Thanks for your time coming on. Where can more people learn about you if they don't already know about you? I feel like every, anybody in the crypto world already does know about you, but where can people uh, learn about you and follow you if they're just learning about you for the first time. Well, I have a lot of several locations. You can obviously go to DaVinciJ15.com. Um, and also, uh, I'm found on YouTube, DaVinciJ15, and Twitter, DaVinciJ15. Also, uh, Instagram, DaVinciJ15. Pretty much everywhere, I'm just DaVinciJ15 because you know what? And the reason why I have the handle DaVinciJ15, which many people have asked, um, is because it's my name is Da Vinci Jeremy, and I because Da Vinci was like always hard to get, just Da Vinci, right? As a as a handle, so I wanted to have a handle that could always, you know, no matter where I went, as I logged in, as I created a username, I had to get that username, and it would be like Da Vinci J, which is Jeremy, of course, and fifteen is my uh, lucky number and also my birthday. Beautiful. Would you ever consider doing a show, uh, an episode on on Monero? Maybe having somebody on there to come talk on, talk about it. Maybe even like a Howard Chu, the inventor of Random X. Or I'd love that. I'd love that. After reading the, I'd like to read uh, Random X and have some questions for for him, right? Because uh, this this blows my mind, right? Um, I, I want to. I want to. I'm, I'm I'm very curious now. Awesome. <laughs> I love your laugh too, by the way. That that's that that's one of the uh, one of the one of the best parts of your videos. It's a, it's an infectious laugh. Man. Thanks again, man. Greatly appreciate it. Enjoy uh, your Chilean uh, summer down there. I will. I will. I got my pool back there, so I'm gonna jump in. Awesome. All right. Have a good day. <laughs> All right. You too. Thanks, buddy. Bye now. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.